So after the Halloween apocalypse was all set up and attempting to juggle about ten different plot threads at once, the second part of Chris Chibnall's six-part epic, War of the Sontarans, as the title would suggest, elects to tell a mostly self-contained story about Sontarans invading Earth's history. While this does result in a much more focused episode, for the most part, it is still not without its issues. The first episode ended on a cliffhanger with the Doctor and companions trapped outside the Lupari shield and about to be erased by the Flux. This kind of gets resolved in War of the Sontarans with a throwaway line about falling through time because of the collision between Vortex and Flux energy. So I guess the Doctor's one last roll of the dice worked after all. Yeah, one of my more general criticisms of Doctor Who Flux I didn't really get to cover in my series overview is that even when stuff does get explained, it's often so vague and passed over so quickly you could easily blink and miss it, which is really not great, especially for the casual audience. It's all very well those of you who write essays about how everything works and makes sense and you just didn't understand it, but the fact that you had to write that essay in the first place is kind of a problem in itself. Anyway, the falling through time plot device has the effect of getting everyone where they need to be, with the Doctor fighting Sontarans in the 1800s, Dan fighting Sontarans in present day Liverpool, and Yaz being teleported to a different story entirely, we'll get to that later. Later. Now, separating the main characters in this way is a good move on Chibnall's part as it gives the Doctor, Yaz and Dan the chance to each have their own story as opposed to the clone entourage dynamic so often present in series 11 and 12. By far the strongest of these plot strands is the one with the Doctor. Putting the Sontarans in the Crimean War just seems like such a no-brainer that I'm surprised no one had thought of it before, since the charge of the Light Brigade has become synonymous with the whole death or glory irrational mentality of warfare. It allows for the Sontarans to be used as a mirror to the British Army, highlighting how as absurd as their ideology is, it's not so different from our own reality. It also gives Chibnall the opportunity to draw attention to another lesser-known historical figure, Mary Seacole, brilliantly portrayed by Sarah Powell. Learning about these underrepresented historical figures is still one of my favourite aspects of the current era, and it's a great way of taking Doctor Who back to its roots as an educational programme. Speaking of representation, it's also nice to see a modern-day alien invasion that takes place somewhere other than London. I myself have visited Liverpool docks many times, and those shots of them turned into a giant space shipyard are just a joy to behold. I'd be very interested to hear what any actual Scousers think about this episode in the comments. While we're on the subject of the present-day stuff, we need to have a conversation about plot armour, because this seemed to be the buzzword on social media upon initial broadcast, and I witnessed a lot of straw manning and just poor critical thinking in general that came along with it. Now, if you're trying to argue that Dan shouldn't have been killed while evading the Sontarans because he's a main character, what did you expect? Then either through ignorance or bad faith, you're completely missing the point. Because these events on screen did not just magically happen. It was the writer and the director who chose to put Dan in front of a squad of Sontarans firing at close range, and they didn't have to do that. Now, as many are quick to point out, plot armour has been around for a long time, with Star Wars being a notable example. But when you're talking about the Sontarans, a race of beings whose very existence revolves around warfare, like it's literally what they are bred for, then it rather undermines the entire point of them if they can't even shoot someone at this short a distance. I'm fully aware that in the grand scheme of things, this is still a nitpick, but it is also the cornerstone of a bigger problem. Mr. Tardis describes War of the Sontarans as walking a tightrope balance of having a genuine threat, but one that can be pretty ridiculous. However, I'm inclined to think that this portrayal of the Sontarans leans far more toward the ridiculous side of that tightrope than the threatening, particularly in the present day segments. A lot of it has to do with the framing. If you compare the scene from The Poison Sky, where Donna is alone on board the Sontaran ship and it feels like there is real danger, to its equivalent in War of the Sontarans, where Dan is waltzing around cracking jokes with his wok, there's a world of difference. And I want to be clear, Sontarans being treated as comedic in itself is not the problem, nor was it ever a problem. If you're one of those who hates Strax on principle because he turn the angry potato-headed aliens into a joke, then you need to grow up. 
No, the issue is that this particular story Chibnall is telling kind of hinges on the Sontarans being a legitimate threat, so when they can't even shoot straight it rather deflates any tension. The way the Sontarans ultimately get defeated doesn't help matters either. There's a generally acknowledged rule in storytelling that if the characters have a carefully devised plan to save the day, then either that plan shouldn't be revealed to the audience until they actually carry it out, or if it is revealed then something has to go wrong, otherwise the payoff is an anti-climax. This is something which is documented in one of my favourite books, How Not to Write a Novel, which if you're curious is also where the phrase clone entourage comes from. The reason I bring it up is that the Doctor's plan to defeat the Sontarans she comes up with using her pointy stick basically goes without a hitch. Okay, so there is a twist in the tale as General Logan then blows up the fleet, but as far as stopping the Sontarans, everything goes according to plan. Similarly, in modern day Liverpool, Carvin Easter's plan to crash Dan's ship into the others and cause a chain reaction also goes exactly as intended. But this is even worse because Carvin Easter showing up is effectively a deus ex machina that renders Dan's entire subplot in the episode completely pointless, because nothing he does contributes to this resolution. It doesn't even make sense why Carvin Easter is here. He claims the Lupari are responsible for letting the Sontarans in before closing the shield, but if the Sontarans have time ships then surely the Lupari shield is irrelevant since they could just start their invasion at any point in the Earth's history. War of the Sontarans has a lot to like about it, as I said, putting the Sontarans in the Crimean War is an inspired move, but overall this is not quite the triumphant return for the Sontarans that some people seem to think it is. I'm Midnight, and I travel in time and space. And trains. Oh yeah, we didn't talk about Yaz. Well, there's not an awful lot to say, honestly, as her subplot is largely all set up revolving around the series arc with Swarm in Azure. If you want to know my thoughts on all that, then check out my Doctor Who Flux series overview from a couple of weeks ago. What I will add is that it's kind of jarring and distracting to keep on cutting away from a Sontaran story to these unconnected events in the Temple of Atropos. I sure do hope this issue doesn't crop up again in a future episode. Yeah, that was another thinly veiled attempt at foreshadowing. <laughs> 